to uh, Unicom's webinar on managing Agile. Our presenter today is Graham uh, Dick from who is the co-owner of Lambry and Lambry is a specialist uh, in the process improvement business. Uh, Graham has been involved with Agile and its evolution since the mid uh, 1990s and over the time has worked with many organizations both small and uh, very large and assisting them to how to adopt and adapt uh, Agile to ensure that they ob uh, obtain full value from their, this approach. This talk uh, is going to be based upon his experiences gained over the many years and with many different organizations. Graham is also speaking at our uh, process improvement uh, conference and the DevOps conference on uh, 20th of November. So if you're interested to listen to him again, do get in touch with Unicom or with Graham. So it's over to Graham now. Thank you. Okay, thanks Dira. Good afternoon everybody. Um, welcome to the talk. Um, if you've got any questions while we're going through, we're going to have a, we'll have a short kind of Q&A opportunity at the end of the talk. Um, and you can kind of post your questions into the little um, control panel uh, on the, the GoToWebinar um, device. Okay. Okay, what we're going to talk about today, it's kind of very brief, what's the history of Agile, where's it, where's it come from, where's it come from, and kind of look at some of the, the kind of challenges of, of working, working with Agile in, in different environments, um, and look at some kind of approaches we can use and, and, and techniques we can use to kind of, uh, if you like, kind of better adapt and fit Agile into, into more challenging, challenging environments. Um, I mean, really, this, this, this talks about fitting into a, an organizational context, which is sometimes ill-adapted to work to Agile's, Agile strengths and to exploit Agile strengths to the, to the very best. So it's kind of like, well, okay, well, you know, in the ideal world, we'd change the org organizational context um, and make it fit. And, and work to the amazing power that Agile gives us. But unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we just basically haven't earned the right to actually have that discussion with the organization yet. So to a certain extent, it's, you know, we've either got to kind of give up and go home, or we've, we're the ones who've got to change and adapt to, to try, and, try and make best use of what, of what we've got um, and, you know, and demonstrate the value that, that Agile delivers. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, there's a, what I'm saying here is, is Agile absolutely has a sweet spot out the box. Out of the box, you know, it's moderately sized to smaller, moderately sized projects. Um, it's where we've got a, a, our development team. We can, we can really get close to the end users, um, and 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 also work closely and continuously with the, with that end user community. Um, you know, through the life of the project, um, it's about having an empowered product owner, someone who actually understands, grasps with, can makes decisions about. What is the vision? What's the vision for the, the solution we're building? Um, and you know, steer and drive it in that direction. Um, and also, it's that product owner and users with with time sufficient time to engage through the life of the project. Um, you know, a bit of the, the traditional approach of engagement at the beginning, and then like, adios amigos. We'll see you at the end. Just you know, it doesn't fly. It doesn't work. It, it's proven not 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 to deliver. Um, the massive power of agile is running iterations end of each iteration demonstrable software that actually delivers value to the customer and then feedback um, feedback and you know mid-course correction um, opportunity at the end of each iteration as we inevitably misunderstand stuff get it fixed move in the actual right direction that users actually intend us to go with a solution okay I guess kind of some classic agile pitfalls is you know we kind of sometimes just kind of ignore the business as usual structures in the organization you know, it's just an elephant trap. It's easy to do. I've done it myself. Um, you kind of try and ignore the kind of existing governance that's there. Um, try and ignore the, the PMO that's there, and just look. Come on, we've got a new way of working. We're really excited about it. It delivers, and try and push that forward. And that can create friction. Um, you know, which 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 can make things difficult. Um, sometimes forgetting that you know actually. I've got I've got agile here, but but what's it actually mean? How do I adapt it and tailor it to fit the particular context um, I'm in? You know, sometimes just running out the box isn't necessarily you know the the right answer at a particular point in time. Um, 
and also sometimes you know it's certainly in larger organizations you know there's just there's just you know there's just stuff that's in place there's you know there's strategic delivery channels with with offshore partners involved and it's like well you know yes i can we can kind of ignore that for ages but sooner or later we've got to try and engage with those guys and actually work out well how can we actually exploit them to help it help us you know bring the benefits of agile um to larger projects um i really like this chart um it's kind of because it's just kind of taking loads of different sort of dimensions on 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 applying agile methods from kind of technical complexity through to the discipline of the enterprise through to the complexity of the domain um and i think the interesting thing is is each of these things is kind of on a continuum really from left to right where you've got kind of like geographical distribution for example you co-located on the left global on the right um you've got organization and distribution um down on the right there it's kind of collaborative going from collaborative through to contractual and i think the interesting thing is that, by and large, most of the industrial experience of Agile is is on the left. You know, is it is it situations where you're on the left of this chart, um, and as you, as you're in a situation which starts moving you to the right, like bigger distribution, like bigger team sizes, um, you know, it, it it's potentially you know there's challenges there. It doesn't mean it's impossible, or um, it's just stuff you've got to start thinking about and think. Well, actually, how do I adapt Agile to work in this context? Um, or how can I adapt the context to work better with Agile? I think a, a absolute what has happened over the last probably 10, 15 years now is that Agile has now become very much, it's just, you know, it's the way we do, it's becoming rapidly, you know, the way we do stuff here. And I'm certainly seeing that as a, as a business. We've got more and more, um, you know, what we call our more traditional customers who are starting to kind of go, hmm, yeah, it's now no longer on the kind of the optional heat, but it's now actually on the, well, you know, why aren't we doing Agile? Because it just makes sense. Um, so it's no longer something that's exotic and esoteric. It's something that, well, it should be on the agenda. We are starting to do it. And how can we actually, and the discussion's gone from like, well, should we, to actually how can we make use of this approach over the wider organization? Because it just makes sense. Um, I mean, the interesting kind of thing to pause very briefly on here is that Agile is often thought of as being something relatively new. Um, but actually, you know, the principles underpinning Agile go way, way, way back. And I, I was doing a little bit of, bit of digging, and you know, they actually go back to the 1960s um, and the Project Mercury stuff, i.e., putting the first sort of American in orbit around um, around the Earth, actually used principles of iterative and incremental development, um, building you know some of the mission control software um, for that project, um, which was a real surprise to me. I never dreamt these principles went back that far. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting, I think, and perhaps something to be aware of now is that, is that actually there's a whole bunch, a whole set of toolbox of kind of techniques and approaches and variants that have been explored over the years. And, you know, that's all ripe for the picking. That's all ripe for, ripe for stealing from, making use of, um, you know, to put into our sort of development solution pot or toolbox that we use today. Okay, so very quick kind of recap. Kind of, well, why does Agile work? What is, what are the features of it that that make it fly? Um, yeah, here's my quick little potted picture of you know of your typical Agile Agile approach. Um, you've got a development team, kind of got a Scrum Master who's you know whose job is to kind of help coordinate and organize and get obstacles out of the way and to and to coach and mentor that team. Um, we've got a product owner who's kind of acts as the bridge between our users and the development team. We've got a product backlog, which is you know a set of wish lists, all the stuff we would like the thing to do. Um, we have print, a sprint planning meeting where we organize what we're going to do in, in an upcoming sprint, and then we run a sprint. And what's a sprint? It's a very short little batch of development work. It's taking some user features, some stuff off the backlog. It's expanding them at, at, at just just in time, having those discussions with the users to say, what do we actually mean by this? And more importantly, how do we know when we have done it? So what's the test criteria? How are we actually going to test this particular feature? Um, and then a bit of analysis, a bit of design, a bit of build, and then test it. And then at the end of that short week, short um, block of time, somewhere between one and four weeks, what have we got? We've got a little slice of our system which we've built, and more importantly, we've tested. Um, and you know, really important there, we can actually go and review that with the customer. We can actually show them, do a demonstration. Immensely powerful, powerful technique because it flushes out those misunderstandings that 
typically and traditionally get left you know, right towards the back end of the project. So we find them here really, really quickly. Because inevitably, we misunderstand stuff, and the customer misunderstands stuff as well, and misunderstands even his own needs. And it's only when he sees a solution that he goes, oh, wow, yes, that's what I kind of meant. And also, there's retrospective, that opportunity to kind of feedback and learn what went well, what didn't go so well, what can we change, what can we do better next time. And I guess the key, you know, one of the key things here, you know, it, it, it's it's the it's the old how to, how do you eat an elephant, how do you eat an elephant syndrome, not in one great lump, but just a bite a bite at a time. And that's to a certain extent what we're doing with Agile. We're breaking down the whole big problem of delivering a potentially quite a large novel system into tiny little chunks, um, which we can address just chunk by chunk by chunk. And the key thing is each little chunk that we're building gives us absolutely fundamental feedback in terms of have we actually, you know, are we going in the right direction? And if we're not going in the right direction, well, it's not a disaster. It's great. We've failed early. We've found out now before we spent a whole bunch of money. We can change direction and get the, get the direction tuned in. Um, so one of, kind of one of the interesting things about Agile, I always think, is that, is that whereas a traditional project, we kind of tend to snowplow risk in front of us, um, and it's only right at the end of the project do you have more, have more certainty about when you're going to deliver. Um, and, and the kind of quality of what you're going to do. Whereas in an agile project, you know, you're actually getting that certainty is starting to increase very, very rapidly from very, very early on, simply because we're just actually producing production quality code really early, right from the very first sprint. Um, and then we're actually showing that to a customer and getting them to effectively sign it off. So yeah, that's what I want. Or no, it isn't. We need to change it like this. Right, cool, we'll do that. So very powerful approach. Okay. In our, you know, often our experience is that, is that when we kind of look at look at a broader broader agile deployment, you know, sometimes some of the practicalities start getting in the way. You know, parts of the business are not as willing to engage with us as we'd like. You know, we've got to embrace outsourcing. Um, sometimes you get people who start getting really kind of helpfully interested, and what I mean by that is the kind of the helpfully interested in terms of the kind of they're almost kind of getting in the way. And to a certain extent, it's because people are genuinely interested, but also people sometimes are very suspicious. You know, what's this newfangled approach? What does it actually mean? Um, you know, how's it going to impact me? Is it going to damage my career path? And so, you know, it's something to start thinking about in terms of actually I've got a bit of people management and expectation management to do here um, as we try and take Agile wider. Um, obviously, you know, you start getting to the point where you're not actually cherry picking your team anymore. You're not self-selecting, you know, your bunch of passionate passionate colleagues who are really passionate about this, about it. You're actually getting everyone else now because you start want to take it wider. Um, and some of those guys are probably not quite as flexible and collaborative as we might like them to be, just because, again, it's the nature of the beast. And also, you know, we're not going to really kind of, you know, get to pick the projects anymore. You know, we're just going to have, you know, we, you know, we're really going to take Agile to, you know, doing the lot, you know, from the, from the, you know, the legacy system which needs a bit of an upgrade, um, you know, through to, through to all sorts of other things. So it, it, it's, you know, we've got to work out, well, perhaps we need, a, you know, some variance in our Agile approaches to deal with these different types of projects. So I guess in terms of, well, what do we do in the real world then? I guess our kind of kind of belief is, is you know, you've just got to actually kind of accept the delivery context you're in. You've actually got to recognize it. Um, often, you know, you've got strong organizational governance requirements that are kind of, you know, to be blunt, horribly waterfall orientated, um, and the most agile, you know, completely agile, unfriendly. Um, and the trouble is, you know, you just got to accept them initially. Um, you know, and we've got to accept that, you know, initially anyway, until we've kind of won the, you know, won the kind of acceptance and 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 the, and the belief of the business that actually, you know, that agile works. Initially, you know, we're just going to need the customer far more than he's going to, than he's going to be available. Um, I've often been in with customers, and it's fascinating. You know, you start having this discussion about, well, actually, kind of, I'd quite like the involvement right through this project, please, and this is why. You have all the good reasons, and they just say, well, would you like to look at my diary? Here, have a look at my diary, and look, it's block booked, doing other stuff, and then you're into this, hmm, okay, maybe we can negotiate mode. Um, whilst we're kind of thinking about potentially adapting Agile, we've got to really hold on to its strengths though and not give those away. You know, empower team, um, embracing change and feedback and to some extent seeking every opportunity to embrace feedback. Um, you know, embrace change because you know inevitably we get stuff wrong, the feedback tells us that and then we change direction. Um, and, and and make best use we can of of all customer contact opportunities. Um, as especially as, as the systems get 
bigger, how do we actually make sure we keep continuously integrating that system as we're building it sprint by sprint, um, making sure we continuously integrate and, and test the whole, um, which is really important. And then also, as we're working through, obviously, make sure we hold on to the fact that you know each sprint we not only repeatedly, you know, we not only test the new stuff that's come out in the sprint, but also what about all the stuff that we built before? We've got a regression test. Keep on testing. Um, so it's really about doing the hard stuff early and making sure that when we get to the you know towards the end of the project, you know, you've actually regression tested stuff you did earlier so many times that you actually you actually are massively confident in the quality um, of the end product. Okay, a bit of just kind of, again, kind of context and just kind of a quick reminder, you know, what are we doing here? Well, often, you know, we're, built, we're, you know, we're building a product or a set of products. They're all about, you know, underpinning some sort of business change or business, you know, or new business solution that's going to be offered up to, at the end of the day, you know, deliver revenue or deliver services um, to, to our, you know, to, to, to the business. Um, and the key thing is, is, is kind of, one of the key things, especially with large projects, is, is to actually un keep an eye on what are the actual objectives of the leadership team. What has actually the project got to do? Because that can be different from the view of the end users who might not quite see that big picture. Um, so it's something that we have to keep an eye on. Um, and also, it's thinking in terms of, well, there'll be governance as we do bigger projects. There's governance involved there. And it's the trouble is it, you know, it feels like it, it feels like, you know, it, it can be desperately, you know, constrictive and in the way and off crying out loud, what on earth is all this here for? But the trouble is it's there for a good reason. You know, at the end of the day, the leadership team, as far as they're concerned, is just simply they're making an investment in this stuff. Um, and they want to there's a return on the investment, that's why they're doing it. And it's about confirming progress. Um, and some you know, some element of confirming progress and that's why they've got a governance structure in place. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is that as, as our business solution involves perhaps touching one or more or many underlying products, each running to its own, to a certain extent, to its own agile heartbeat, um, we've got to think, worry about dependencies between those and across those. You know, what combination of features need to be delivered at a particular point in time to to allow, you know, effectively an, you know, an increment of service to be either demonstrated to, to the project sponsors um, or actually um, potentially released at a particular point. Um, and I've, bol I've bolted in here some, this is, this is this some statistics on the right there, which is taken from um, a company called Version 1. They do an annual state of, state of Agile development survey, um, which is very interesting, and I'll certainly urge you to go and have a look if you're interested. Um, it's just talking about, you know, barriers to agile adoption and you know some of the stuff you know people are just kind of writing in and saying well you know over half of people said one of the big challenges is just to change organizational culture it's really hard and that's you know an element of you know a very waterfall focused governance is a big aspect of that organizational culture it's just the organization's not ready to think agile okay and i guess one thing we've kind of learned is that is that is it's really, you know, you just can't change the big picture. You can't change the, the, the whole organizational context, really, until we've actually um, demonstrated the utility and the efficacy of what, what, what we do. Um, yes, we believe Agile works. Yes, we know Agile works. But the larger business, it's just stuff they're hearing about. Um, <clears throat> until we've kind of earned the right um, to be heard, we've just got to play by their rules. Um, so we've got to work with the organization rather than fighting against it. And it's the most effective way of getting change and work with it, demonstrate that this approach actually works. And then we can actually start slowly, slowly getting the organization to change. <clears throat> Thinking in terms of um, some of the stuff we're doing inside the approach now, I think our product owner has an interesting perspective. He's kind of got a balance. There's two things here because he's got a balance. He's got a balance kind of what the you know what the kind of the, the actual users are wanting from the solution but also try and keep a kind of big picture leadership perspective um in mind you know what is the big picture what are the over the, the key features um from a business benefits perspective um that are required and when are they required um you know traditionally and classically you know you tend to just worry about functionality you know what features do we need and when and Time, and it's easy to forget or to, 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 take, to take your eye off the ball of thinking about, well, what about time, time and 
time dependencies? Um, what about dependencies between components or between subsystems? What about dependencies even between projects um, and between business processes and operational needs? Um, you know, all stuff you've got to kind of think in then. What, and, and what these dependencies may well do is they may well actually alter the order we deliver particular um, functionality in. So we need to think about that. So building the product, what do we do? Well, answer. Obviously, we, we, we don't. We build it over, we incrementally and iteratively build a product up over a number number of sprints of short iterations of one to sort of one to sort of four, one to four weeks or so. Um, but what happens when, as we're working through, you know, we start introducing complexity and scale? Um, you know, product back backlog builds in complexity. We start saying, well, actually, we need rather than just one team, we need multiple teams involved in this. What happens when actually we haven't really got enough product owners to go around? What happens when we've got the risk that you know the product owners start to diverge from the vision? You know, how do we allocate the backlog across all those teams? And what about performing systems integration in the sprint? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because an individual team integrates the stuff it's doing. Um, who actually gets to integrate the overall end-to-end -end system and pull all that together? Um, you know, someone's got to worry about that because clearly, you know, you've got to think in terms of your definition of done. Done often actually is I've actually put the entire contents of Sprint into configuration management. I've built the entire system as it is stands to date. I've tested it all and I've regression tested up to date. Um, I often deployed it on some sort of deployment or test box as well. Um, so when you start to talk multi teams, who gets to think about all that? What if some of those developers are in a third party? And then also, you know, when you start getting multi-teams in there, thinking about what about reuse? Um, what about actually maybe we need some direction because what happens if teams solve sort of mechanistic problems in multiple different ways? Well, that's a bit of a waste of time, isn't it? Um, and how do we learn? How do you do cross-team learning as well? When one team starts going, well, actually, there's a better way of doing this. We can tune the approach better to fit our context. How do we actually share that information around across the, across all the other teams as well? Um, it's just something to, something to think about there. And also, then we kind of throw in some geographical distribution for for good measure, um, and you know and that may can make that communication challenge challenge tougher. Of course, the, the challenge is as we kind of grow up to a certain extent, then distribution just sometimes just becomes inevitable. Um, you know, we can get into this trap, and we've seen this with, with um, customers we've worked with, where, you know, actually, I don't have enough engaged end users, and they don't all like the travel, traveling all the time to, you know, make sure they're kind of co-located with teams. It just, you know, it just starts getting really hard. Um, we've talked a bit about this already, you know, completing full systems integration within the sprint then becomes, becomes difficult. Um, and the trouble is, as soon as you kind of compromise that, that's, your, you know, one of Agile's greatest strengths, you've kind of bung out the window. So, that's no good. Um, evolving a kind of a evolving understanding of the structure and integrity of the system starts becoming harder as well because you're looking across. You know, you've got multiple teams there, kind of exploring and evolving. How do we keep them kind of coordinated so they actually keep keep going in the in a kind of a, in a kind of co coordinated, coherent direction? You know, that's something we need to we need to to think about. And also, just you know. Getting the teams organised and sorted, such that they've, they've, you know, who allocates requirements across all the teams, um, you know, how do we ensure the feedback gets back over? over. So it's scale brings challenges. So in terms of kind of relearning, you know, I've talked about relearning here. I mean, one of the things we can do is 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 instead of thinking of the architecture as that, well, that's just something that's going to evolve. Let's put actually put the horse before the cart. And actually think in terms of, well, actually, architecture is a first-class citizen, and we can use architecture or an idea of, of, of this is the structure of our system that's going to evolve as something to help direct and organize our development teams. We might need to think in terms of, okay, that kind of delivery life support environment we were talking about, like allocating, allocating features onto teams, which do we just let teams pick features at random? Um, do we have some sort of system for allocating them um, onto teams, some sort of method? Then perhaps we need a, some sort of cross-functional team that will do that. 
perhaps they, we also need to be able to listen to feedback and, and listen to improvements um, coming up from individual teams. Again, our cross-functional team can do that. So something we've come across, especially when you're working with third parties, is you've got to be really, really careful about what's our definition of done. And by definition of done, what I mean is, 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 is you know, when is a sprint done, actually? What's it, what do I have to have actually got achieved to have completed, you know, basically closed the sprint off? You know, can I, is it just enough to have written my code um, and run some unit tests? Maybe that's done. Um, actually, maybe I actually need to put everything back into configuration management and then check it out onto another box and build it all from scratch and then run the tests for that, you know, for that sprint. Is that done? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Maybe actually I need to do that and then I also need to run regression tests to ensure that I haven't broken anything from previous sprints. Well, maybe that's done. Or well, maybe I also need, what about any, any documentation, any help guides, anything like that? Maybe that needs to be done as well. So really think about what a definition of done is, and that's absolutely key for bringing in third parties, because clearly third parties are going to want some sort of payment schedule, and often that payment schedule will be links around um, delivering features. Um, and we're going to be absolutely certain that when they say we've delivered a feature, their definition of deliver is the same as our definition. Um, otherwise, we have all sorts of challenges. You know, we're effectively then paying people to do stuff twice, which isn't clever. We need to think in terms of building and testing system as close to continuous as practically possible. So, how can we make sure that we, you know, we absolutely that we actually build and test as close to the end of the sprint as possible? Um, something we can do as well is is think in terms of well, inevitably we'll build up technical debt, you know, stuff that we just got to fix and change through the life of the project. Um, and so sometimes it's worth, especially in a large project, thinking in terms of just planning some time for technical debt because we know it's going to happen. Um, and so having having you know some time in there to do that to actually deal with that can be quite helpful. Um, and also, kind of planning, it, it's you know it's not anathema to an agile project. Um, we can plan an engagement with existing governments, work out how we're going to do this. It's not difficult. Um, you know, we can plan for benefits and dependencies. When are we actually going to deliver particular benefits? And at which point do dependencies become critical and lock in? Um, you know, this will, this will change over time. Of course it will. But, um, you know, as, as we become more experienced in what we're delivering. But there's nothing wrong with actually relatively early in the project actually having a vision, having a view of this is what it looks like going forward. This is where we deliver key features. Um, and this is where we you know, have key dependencies locking together to enable enable features. So looking at government governance here, you know, is my my some sort of daft governance scheme on the top there, um, you know, and it and it's reasonably typical some sort of startup feasibility delivery closure kind of life cycle, um, and at their view that you kind of forget you've got a bunch of grand delivery and grand design going on and some final massive implementation, you know, with a pre-implementation review. But how do we actually map Agile into that? Well, one thing we can do is we can synchronize our sprints with governance boundaries because that starts making things tidier. Um, we can look at our sprint reviews, end each every sprint, look at the review there, look at the information and the data we're getting out of that, and actually how can we, can we use that information to help us um, you know, provide the information that the government, gov our governance scheme is requiring. Um, and I guess it, it, it's thinking about, well, the governance isn't there for, you know, it's not there for nonsense. It's there because actually it's a proxy for earned value. It's, have I, it's actually asking the kind of question, have I done enough given the spend to date? Um, you know, and am I on track to deliver what's actually needed? Um, and I think one of the nice things about Agile is to certain extent it gives a fantastically crisp answer to that because rather than saying, well, actually, you know, I've got a lovely big design document and um, I've got loads of source code written, um, but I haven't actually integrated it or tested it yet, um, I can actually say, well, we've got this set of features, they're built, they're thoroughly tested, they work, you know, we've, we've had user demonstrations with them, they're the right features. Um, and we can, you know, and we can deploy them because we put them into a, put the, put them onto test, a te a, you know, a, a clean test box at the end of each sprint to to thoroughly test. That's a massive demonstration of earned value of what we've actually delivered for the spend to date. 
think in terms as well that sometimes the governance requirements is placing kind of mandatory requirements on what we need to do in a sprint. Um, yeah, sometimes unfortunately, you know, you just got to produce an architecture document. Sounds awful, um, but you know, think think smartly about it. Um, you know, and sometimes it's just initially initially in agile adoption, you're just going to have to go with things like that, um, and, and sometimes just work them in. Think in terms of dependencies. You know, we sometimes get business critical dependencies in terms of how to get a bit of functionality released at a particular, available at a particular point to meet the needs of a business case. Um, sometimes we've got functionality which is, is there to enable um, enable some feature in you know, a related system or subsystem. So we can think in terms of we can map these things out over time when we're actually planning, certainly at the early stage of the project, map them out over time, um, map when functionality will be delivered. You know, obviously the content of the of early sprints, sprints is more rigorously tested because we're repeating and regression testing each sprint. Um, yeah, to build this sort of view, you know, you're going to require collaboration between the business and the technical, you know, between our team and also the business, um, which is fine. Um, and obviously, yeah, it's going to change as we learn more. You know, yes, stuff changes, um, and that's fine, and we've got to welcome change. So lay out, lay out, you know, lay out a plan for a delivery plan like this. Um, and it, you know, it's about making 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 things happen according to you know according to some you know the required timelines. Um, we do have flexibility and discretion within the framework, um, and obviously we've got to have really close collaboration. You know, we've got to listen listen to our teams, and when they say they can't do it, you know, we work with them to understand why it doesn't work. We just kind of crash and impose this sort of structure on our teams. Um, but it's got you know it has its positives as well. Um, one of the interesting things is obviously if we if we've got key deliver key functionality scheduled and it's not happening, well, it's a great early warning sign. You know what's actually going on there. Um, you know perhaps what it is is actually we just need to do a replan because we've critically underestimated our velocity for all sorts of reasons. Well, that's fine. Um, you know maybe there's something else going on um, that we haven't anticipated. But the whole the beauty of the approach, the agile approach, is 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 it gives it it gives us early warning about things. Something else we've found is really useful is we can actually kind of provide some provide focus to our sprints. Um, so we can have some very early work in the, in the overall life cycle of the project, which is about kind of focus on well, what's the scope of the thing we're building? Um, what are the key non-functional requirements? You know, perform performance, security, usability, that sort of thing. Um, what about contracts with third parties, getting those sorted out, maybe some technical prototypes to prove some key technologies. Um, we can then kind of get into a kind of can we build it type of phase. Um, and what we're doing here is we're kind of cherry picking particular stories that will allow us to basically drill steel threads down through our tech, you know, basically for our solution stack, um, prove that our solution architecture or proposed solution architecture is up to the job. Give us the framework on which we can kind of actually do some um, scalability testing, some um, performance testing, and actually demonstrate to ourselves that yeah, we've got a solution architecture here that will deliver what our what our um, project needs to deliver. Um, we can test the supply, you know, our supply chain end to end. Exercise our exercise the approach. We've got multiple teams working together. Actually, exercise how are we all going to work together. Actually, test that approach and get it working. The interesting point is when we kind of work a little bit through there, what we find is that we actually get a scalability point. We've actually got an architecture, a solutions framework and structure that is, to a certain extent, is tested. We know it will scale. We understand the shape of the solution. We just don't understand all the, 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 the details, but we can actually scale at this point and start bringing in and start expanding. So, for example, um, you know, individual teams now own particular subsystems in the solution architecture, and you work work with them. Um, so that gives an interesting point where we can potentially scale there, um, and then we can move into kind of a, a build it phase where actually now we're focusing. We've, we don't need to worry so much about the the structure of the beast. We've worked that lot out. Now it's about focusing on functionality um, and delivery of functionality. And then lastly, a business as usual phase where we're actually it's about 
closing down the development project and, and completing the transition to operations. Risk can be really useful, thinking about risk. Um, one of the, again, you know, it, 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 we can exploit the power of iterative and incremental delivery here um, to actually drive out technical risk early, to de-risk our project. Um, you know, how do we do that? You can identify, we can think in terms of our potential solution stack, think of the solution space, think about what we're being asked to do, identify a number of technical risks, and then we can simply map those to particular stories, to user stories. And we've got user stories allocated over a number of iterations of sprints. And then as we actually deliver those stories, we're actually mitigating that technical risk. We're actually proving that the risk either has blown up in our face and has become an issue because a particular element of the, of the um, solution stack isn't fit for purpose, for the purpose we wanted it, um, or actually, well, no, it does work, and we've made it work. Um, and so the great thing is we're actually, can, over, over a relatively short period of time, we can drive a lot of the technical risk out of the project, so stabilizing the, the remainder of the delivery and actually, you know, meaning we're less likely to be kind of unpleasantly surprised by things going wrong. Architecture is really useful because we can think about it if we actually kind of sketch out, and this doesn't have to be a massively intensive, you know, unified modeling language drama. Um, you know, we can sketch this out on big sheets of paper on the wall, and I've done this in the past many a time, just sketch out an architecture on the wall and identify what the interfaces are between architectural components. Um, and when we've done that, we can use that as a kind of vehicle to allocate teams. You know, we can have give teams responsibility for particular subsystems um, through the architecture. That's, you know, that's one approach we can do, we can use. We can know then, you know, in terms of, well, what teams need to collaborate to deliver a particular user story. Um, So we can work out that, okay, to deliver user story three there, we actually, you know, each of these teams, lobbed in green, needs to do something critical to make that story happen. You know, here's another story, and, you know, you get a different little matrix slicing down through the architecture. So it's kind of useful thinking about the big picture there. What happens when we get multiple teams involved? Well, I guess one of the things you've got to kind of worry about is you've got to worry about throughput. Because um, actually what we want is we want the teams busy, we want them working to a nice heartbeat. Um, so we're going to make sure that you know, we can feed, it, feed each team at each stage. So we're, we're, we're ready to have those conversations about stories that are allocated to teams. We're able to allocate stories to teams without, without kind of putting a big pause in there. Um, we want to try and keep this thing as agile as possible. Um, and if we get kind of stuff building up, blocking up on a particular team, then, well, that's, a, that's an early warning. You know, what, something's going wrong there. How do we do this? Well, often what we've done in the past when we work with this is, is you've got to think in terms of a kind of a program team. Someone's got to have the big picture and maintain the big picture. Um, you know, plan stages and iterations, establish and maintain architecture. You know, just allocate um, requirements onto, onto teams. Um, Look at the performance of the whole. Um, you know what is our velocity as we're you know what's the you know the velocity of the whole as as it as it's moving forward. Look at contracts. Um, so we've got some of the teams that are actually third parties. You've got to actually manage those contracts on an ongoing basis. Um, someone's got to provide do the end-to-end -end integration. Um, often you know a program team is a great place to put that, and, the, and then the end-to-end -end test as well, the non-functional requirements testing. What my development teams then? Well, they do what they do. They develop individual modules or individual user stories. Um, they're driving, you know, continuously integrating, in, providing, you continuously integrating their modules and testing their modules. Um, and often you've got a, some sort of business analyst from a program team is allocated as a liaison point for kind of two or three teams, um, so you can share a, a BA or a product owner across two or three teams um, and keep coordinated and organized through the, through the idea of the program team. Looking at kind of, well, what about end-to-end -end integration and test? If you've got a number of teams running in each sprint, you know, running in parallel, that can be interesting because each team will test their own subsystem or their own their slice of functionality, but 
who kind of does the full end-to-end, -end? who builds the full end-to-end? -end? Well, sometimes what you have to do is, again, as I said, it's our program team gets that responsibility, but sometimes you've actually got to slip that end, full end-to-end -end test into the next iteration. Um, so, for example, here, sprint one, actually we're doing the final end-to-end -end integration and regression test actually during the time where sprint two is going on. So things slip by one iteration. So if there's an issue found in the big big picture kind of issue found there, actually it doesn't get to get addressed until sprint three. So it slips. So issues issue you know issue addressing does slip. But it, this will work with multiple teams. We've used this before on very large projects where you've got thirty or forty scrum teams working working in parallel with with third parties involved as well. And that's where something this sort of approach comes into its own. What about in terms of, remember, just kind of feeding the teams and providing space for thinking and architecture? Well, what we need to do is we need to gain thinking advance advance. So sprint two, <coughs> you know, we can basically work out well, what requirements we're going to deliver in sprint two, what any elaboration of architectural requirements that are required or, or, or plan or replanning happens in sprint one, that then gets consumed in sprint two, and then the products of sprint two are actually finally bolted together and end-to-end -end tested in, in sprint three. So you kind of get a, 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 it's kind of a diagonal life cycle starts creeping in there. And then kind of towards the end here, just thinking in terms of what about collaboration? You know, often, you know, in organizations that are kind of new to Agile or starting to just want to scale it scale it wider. I mean the key thing about Agile is is, you know, it, it's it's all about not exhaustively writing down our requirements up front because it's just really hard to do that. It's that recognition. That's really hard. Everyone finds that difficult and it's ever prone. Um, so what we do is we actually write just enough requirements. The user story is a fantastic vehicle for that. Um, you know, it's this promise to communicate at a later date. And we do the communication when it's fresh at the point of consumption, have a dialogue between product owner, user and developer. Um, and tester and actually come up with this is what we actually want the thing to do at this point and then actually crystallize that, test it, code it, you know, code it, test it, and actually ask the question, is this does this meet our needs, you know, there and then. Um, but that demands constant collaboration or pretty regular collaboration anyway, to actually make that fly and make it work. But the beauty of it is is we're much more likely to actually deliver the right product using that approach. The trouble is, is what happens when we don't have that engagement that we wanted with our user community? Um, you know, the risk then is we ain't getting the engagement, therefore we're not discovering where we've inevitably got stuff wrong or misunderstood stuff. And so that's where we start creeping in. We're either going to deliver something that's substandard or something that's going to require expensive rework, you know, late in the project life cycle, which is a pain. You know, we're, we're losing the benefits there. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, there's no real magic answer to this. Um, Somehow you've got to try and keep collaboration high, um, or make just make more effective use of the collaboration you've got. You know, maybe you've got to we've got to look at supplementing our user stories with outlined or detailed use cases as appropriate. Maybe what we can do is we can actually schedule in blocks of time from our user community um, and actually book them in o over time. So we get we don't get them all the time, but we get them in blasts blasts of kind of you know time where we can use them effectively to look at what we're doing in a particular sprint. But it's, it's really sometimes you just got to wrestle with that and, and see how you can get the best collaboration you can. Kind of in summary, really, um, this kind of chart is trying to just show um, a mapping between a kind of complexity, if you like, and kind of size, and just trying to make the point that. There's, a, there's an area where you've got stuff on the bottom left there, really, really simple projects where it kind of doesn't really matter. And then there's a whole tranche of area where actually you start to get more complex, more novel um, problems to solve. And also we're starting to get, um, you know, it, it, it's, the project is getting, you know, the solution is getting bigger and bigger. But we're in this kind of agile sweet spot, an area where agile absolutely sings and works beautifully. Then as we get bigger, perhaps, perhaps, we, perhaps we're solving a bigger and bigger problem. Um, well, we're into this agile adaption zone. And lastly, we can get to a point where actually we get really, really huge or really, really complex or stuff is just kind of doomed to be really difficult and we've got that, you know, it's the fragile, the fragile zone, should we say. And I think the key thing to, th to think about is, is um, oops, sorry, beg your pardon, is to, is to think in terms of, well, recognize when you're in that fragile zone, 
um, and actually what can I change to get back into my agile adaption zone um, at the very least. So where am I get to the point where actually no stuff's just getting broken and then recognize that stuff's broken and try and spool back out of that somehow. Okay, and lastly, as a last slide, I just wanted to mention, this is something we've got involved with as a business recently, well, about the last year, a group called IC Agile, um, an Agile certification body. And I think one of the things that fascinates me about them, what they've done is they've, they've kind of worked out a, an Agile roadmap, really, um, which is about taking Agile into the various disciplines that you often find in a large organization. Um, so they're forced in terms of what's Agile mean for my business analyst or product owner community with so they've got a value management stream. What's it mean from a management, project management and program management community? So there's an agile management stream. What's it mean for the folk amongst us who actually are really interested in coaching agile and taking agile wider? So there's an agile coaching stream. Um, our developers, agile development, our testers, agile testing. And then our leadership team, senior managers, um, you know, there's an agile leadership stream. So there's an interesting approach here to thinking in terms of taking your agile education wider. Okay, so that's close that off. If anyone's got any questions, um, we've got probably got a minute or two, then you can put them in on the little questions panel, um, kind of far away. It doesn't show any uh, questions yet. Shall we just give everybody a, min uh, a minute to see if anything comes in? No? Okay. I'll just, yes, just give you a couple of minutes to see if anything comes in, otherwise... No? If not, come. 